Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is a webinar of the technical committee of the um, Agricultural Robotics and Automation um, Technical Committee, a technical committee of Agriculture Police Robotics and Automation Society. Just check. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Okay. So my name is Amy Tab, and you should have received an email if you registered for this webinar through Zoom. And so today, Maria Popovich from the University of Bonn is gonna be presenting Intelligent Decision-Making and Autonomy for Agricultural Robotics. So um, oh, let me change the screen. Um, so uh, this is a webinar format uh, through Zoom. So everyone is muted by default. And I'm going to uh, let uh, Maria get her screen share going while I um, uh, tell you some more about the logistics of the webinar. So Maria, you can just uh, get started. So the way we do these is about halfway through, there'll be a break for questions and you can write all your questions in uh, through the chat or through the Q&A. Uh, now everyone's pretty familiar with Zoom. If you're uh, joining through the YouTube link, you can also write your questions in the chat there. So on the upper um, left-hand corner of the screen, there's the live on YouTube. So that's uh, not as bandwidth heavy as, um, as Zoom if you wanna go there too. So then I will uh, collect all the questions and I'll present them to Maria. Then at the end of the webinar, we'll also have a time for questions. All right, so um, that's all I, oh, and if you want to join the technical committee and get uh, announcements for future webinars, you can go to our website, IEEEAGRA.com, uh, and there's a join tab there. All right, thank you. Hi, thanks, Amy, for the introduction, and welcome to my webinar. Um, my name is Maria, I'm a junior research group leader at the Cluster of Excellence FINRAB and um, the University of Bonn. Uh, so I'm really happy to have the opportunity to meet you here um, virtually and to tell you about myself and our research. And um, especially thanks to Amy for being an excellent organizer and host for the webinar. So to start off, um, Looking at the list of attendees, I can see many new faces. So I'll start by briefly introducing myself and my background and where I come from in more detail. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm a junior research group leader in FINRAB and the University of Bonn. I started this position in mid-February this year. Um, before that, I did uh, one year of postdoc at Imperial College London after finishing my PhD at ETH Zurich. And before that, I did my undergraduate again in the UK. I grew up in the UAE, and I'm originally from Serbia, so I'm a very international person. So to answer the question of how I started working in agricultural robotics and being um, involved in this area of study, this really came about from my involvement with the Horizon 2020 project Flourish, which some of you may have heard of. Um, this is a project I was working on um, during the majority of my PhD, which really set the context for the research work that we did there. So I'll first tell you, um, going backwards, uh, a bit about this project and what it was about. As I said, some of you may have heard of it. So it was a three and a half year Horizon 2020 project that ran from 2015 when I started my PhD uh, to 2018. Um, and the project involved many European partner institutions that we can see on the right. So overall, the goal of the project was to develop a robotic solution uh, for precision agricultural applications. And on the figure, we can see a schematic of um, how this would work. So the main idea was to have an aerial vehicle and the ground vehicle working collaboratively um, on a farm. And the concept was that the aerial vehicle would first autonomously survey the field and collect some data, then pass this data to the ground vehicle so that it can navigate on the field and perform targeted intervention only where it is needed. And all this information that the robots collect together collaboratively was um, collected and communicated to um, the farmer through a user interface. So this was also one of the work packages um, that was part of the project. 
So I tell you about this project um, to get an idea about my background and also present some of the results in the next slide. Um, in general, the project was um, very successful. We're very happy with the results. And you can see some of the results that came out of it and the publications on the website um, that I put the link to here on the slide. So um, moving on to where I'm working today, um, I'm working at the Cluster of Excellence uh, Finerob, um, which is based here in Germany. So what is Finerob? So basically, Finerob is a cluster of excellence that started in 2019, and it involves the University of Bonn working together with the Research Institute um, here at Forschung Centrum Ulic. Um, they're working together um, in order to meet uh, demands for the increase in increasing need for crop production with robotics and modern technologies. So in this cluster, we can conduct um, interdisciplinary research uh, to find solutions. How can we better observe? How can we analyze and understand plants in a targeted way so that we can specifically treat them and thus reduce the environmental footprint of agricultural practices leading to a more sustainable future. So in this cluster, um, we do research with this aim in mind, and the research is organized into six core projects, which form the key pillars for this collaborative interdisciplinary research. So what are these core projects? So over here, we can see them. There are about 150 people, including 16 PIs, um, spread across these core, core projects and the cluster. So as we can see here, the core projects are very diverse. It's a very interdisciplinary space to work in. And each core project focuses on very different areas of study. And the idea is that by working together in the cluster of excellence, we can um, interact with other researchers, work with them, and learn from them so that we can interface our knowledge and build these solutions uh, towards um, more sustainable um, environmental practices. So now in the next part of the talk, now that we understand um, what FINORAB is about and our general working organization, I'm going to zoom in more in our research group, uh, which is in core project four, autonomous in-field intervention, and then use this to introduce our research vision and some of the work that we're currently doing um, over here in our research group. So, um, in uh, core project four, we have a junior research group led by me, um, and my team consists currently of two PhD students, um, Liren and Julius, that we can see here on the slide. So us three started working um, and founded the research group in earlier this year um, in March, so that's relatively recently, so we hope we'll be able to do a lot of exciting work together. And I uh, also would like to thank this opportunity to thank uh, my PhD students for also contributing to this um, presentation on the next slides. Okay, so now moving on uh, to what we actually research and the research topics um, in a research group. So first of all, we are um, roboticists. Um, we have a background in, in robotics and um, algorithms. So I would like to present um, kind of our vision as to how um, we can develop a new roles for robots in agriculture. And the work that we do is all about enabling um, these new roles. So as we know, robots are intelligent and programmable devices. So let's have a look at the spectrum of autonomy in, in robots and think about how they can contribute on different levels. So on the base level, at the lowest level of autonomy, we have um, a situation where everything is done manually by humans, all the work that needs to be done, such as data collection, uh, weaving operations, and other um, activities that we can see here on the slide. So now if we think about uh, robots becoming uh, more autonomous, we have robots being involved in our uh, practices, but humans are mostly using robots in a manually controlled way to replace conventional machines. So for example, this could be flying um, drones with a joystick or using some kind of app interface to collect data and to study it. And this is what most of us are familiar with um, currently and what most people use in agricultural robotics. However, in our work, we're interested in a level of autonomy above this one. So rather than using the robots to replace current methods in agriculture, 
we want to really challenge existing approaches and exploit the fact that robots are programmable and we can have them make their own decisions without us telling them what to do. So by programming, we can um, have robots make informed decisions based on the current state of the field, and they can even cooperate together in entirely new workflows where humans take um, less control. So in this way, we hope we can have robots doing more autonomous tasks and making useful decisions by themselves um, with minimal intervention. However, in order to realize this um, very ambitious vision, we need to design new algorithms that allow robots to reason about field environments and make these decisions on their own. So over here on the slide, we can see some examples of decision-making scenarios that we look at. And in each of these cases, the robot need to look at the state of the environment and the field and reason about the best possible choice to make there. So this gives a very uh, general overview. So now I'll move on to um, our motivation by looking at a sp more specific example of a single um, drone or a single UAV that can fly at different altitudes to monitor a field. So in many monitoring scenarios, what we want to do is deploy the UAV and survey specific characteristics um, within this field that we can see here in the example with the top-down view. So following a conventional approach on the lower level of autonomy, we can create a um, predefined lawnmower zigzag type path to cover the field at a fixed altitude, given the limited battery life of the UAV. So if we know how much the UAV can fly, we can um, exhaustively cover the field using such a pattern. And this strategy is simple, fast, and also what is readily available in most commercial products today. However, if we think about what's actually happening on the field, what if there are certain regions that need to be inspected more closely? For example, what if there are some anomalies on the field or we need to map weeds more closely in certain areas or detect some plant diseases? So if we use such an exhaustive strategy, the main drawback is that the entire environment is mapped with a fixed resolution limited by the UAV battery life. And because we don't know where these interesting regions such as anomalies or reads are in advance, we can't focus on improving the mapping accuracy in these areas. And instead we waste the valuable energy on exhaustive mapping. And what we want to do is create better maps where we like targeted information about these areas of interest. Um, so we reason that through an active decision-making, in this case, active sensing approach, we can perform more efficient and more targeted monitoring by allowing the robot to replan online and decide where to go next. And this way we can actually adaptively focus on collecting more data in more interesting areas, leading to much better use of the limited battery life. However, in order to uh, realize this vision, uh, there are several um, challenges that we need to address from a research point of view. So first we need to decide how do we want to model this environment, this field, and we need to define an objective quantifying how useful potential measurements are. So we need to be able to say that one measurement at one location of the field is more useful to us for mapping than another. Secondly, we need a planning algorithm that can balance between exploiting these re regions of interest as they're discovered and also exploring the unknown environment. And it also needs to satisfy, um, generate paths that satisfy the robot dynamic and endurance constraints. Moreover, if we want to replan um, from time to time online and focus on specific interesting areas, we need to make sure that the algorithm is computationally fast enough to run onboard and online uh, computationally constrained platforms such as very small UAVs that we use um, for monitoring. With a UAV um, equipped with a camera, a key trade-off lies in the fact that the sensing data is noisy and at different resolutions. So for example, if mapping the field, the UAV can see the same point from different altitudes. Um, and as a result, we need a sensor model that accounts for the fact that the higher up the UAV goes, the more area it can see on the ground. However, um, the resolution and most likely the uncertainty of the measurements decreases. 
And so we need the sensor model to capture these elements. And in general, these aspects make the decision-making problem complex and also very computationally challenging to solve. These three key elements form the foundation of our research work. And these are the challenges that we're trying to address as um, we get robots to become more autonomous. And so the goal of our research group is to develop frameworks to address the challenges associated with decision-making in uncertain 3D environments um, that can be run on computationally limited systems. And we hope that such algorithms will allow us to push the boundaries of autonomous operation and ascend the scale of robot autonomy and agricultural robotics, where they take on new roles in more autonomous ways. And so in this talk, I'll use as an example this uh, UAV-based terrain monitoring application, but we can also uh, generalize these methods and extend them for use with different sensors and different actions and also different robots. So this is something to keep in mind as we go through the webinar. So um, next I want to uh, take these challenges and tie uh, together these elements that we presented to try to build the internal structure of an autonomous system and see how they effectively fit together. So first we assume that a robot is equipped with a sensor, for example, a depth camera or a multispectral camera that it used to, uses to take the measurements. And then um, we can use these measurements um, to construct a map of the environment of interest. So in our case, this is the target field that our UAV is surveying. And when we construct the map, we might have some prior information that we want to add to our map. Um, for example, from previous field trials. Otherwise, um, we would assume an unknown environment where only the current measurements during the current mission are used to um, update it. So during the mission, the idea is that we have a planning unit that uses these environmental maps built online to create new trajectories uh, according to an objective. So this objective could be to collect data more efficiently in targeted area of interest. And this way we close the loop between action and perception so that the robot is actually reacting to the measurements that it collects online and uses this to generate more informed actions. So in this workflow, um, the main, uh, the key ingredient here is this utility function that we see um, in pink which is used to reflect the aim of the mission. So what do we want the robot to do or sense? Where do we want it to collect more measurements? And we use this uh, to measure how valuable uh, future actions are. So at this point, I would just like to take a break um, to see if there are any questions. Um, we presented some parts about our current work setup about our, our key research vision, our challenges, and this overall system architecture. So before moving on to the theory, I think it's a good idea to take a break and process the information and see if there are any questions. Okay, thank you very much. And um, we did have one, we have some questions. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, um, so for monitoring fields, how do you account for individual weeds that may not be in the main path of the UAV? So one of the uh, kind of setups that we use for this, um, that we'll also show more slides on later, is we use the weed classifier on board the UAV um, so that it processes images at, as it receives them, like based on a deep learning model. And then it tells us the probability of actually finding weeds at a particular location in the environment based on the image. So we project that image according to the current pose of the UAV um, to the ground. And then we can say that this is where that weed was observed with such probability. I okay. hope that answers the question. Okay, and is the crop that you're working with, is this all, is this all for one crop or for a different species? So right now we're looking at the application of weed mapping um, because this is something that um, we worked with before. But uh, we, um, considering we just started also in the cluster, we hope that uh, to get more input from fellow researchers to see 
what um, from the agricultural side, whether it makes sense to use this in other applications, for example, finding particular species or what kind of plant diseases can we map? Because the workflow itself is quite general. Okay. Um, and then what uh, another question that just came in is what type of sensors have you used in the data acquisition process? And have you used other types of cameras in addition to multispectral cameras? Um, no, actually now we're trying to run um, our algorithms on some data that was acquired with a thermal um, camera to see whether we can map areas of high or low temperature and define these uh, regions as being more interesting for the mapping applications. But this is something that we literally started doing um, now before we were just working with uh, multispectral um, information to um, use this as the input to that uh, weed classification module. But I'm really excited about um, also incorporating different types of sensors in this workflow. Okay. And then, um, yeah, this was my question um, mm -hmm. too that just came in. Are the calculations for the map creation made in real time? And if yes, what hardware do you use? Um, yes, so we were, um, a previous I'll also show some of the experimental results where this was running um, on board the I-7, on board our drone that we used in a Flourish. Um, so this was uh, done online, but uh, as I will show later in the example, um, we're trying to speed up our algorithms so that we can map um, with higher resolutions, because at that point, things were done in a very coarse resolution. And we're trying to, as I'll show in the next slides, um, see how we can adapt the map resolution as well to speed up this whole process and enable more online real-time applications. Okay, I see. And then at what, um, at what crop stages exactly do you collect um, UAV data? Um, so we were collecting this um, on a sugar beet field um, where the crops were like, I'm, I'm not an agricultural scientist, so I was mostly involved with uh, collecting data. Um, at that point, um, I think it was like a re relatively early or intermediate stage of growth. So we released a um, data set called Weed Map, um, if it's helpful to anyone to take a look at, which contains the data that was used for most of these algorithms, and then you can have a look. Okay. Okay, very good. So let's um, continue with your presentation, and then everyone uh, who's attending, if you if you have questions, just go ahead and write them in the chat and then uh, we can ask them at the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Maria. Okay, perfect. So thanks for the very insightful questions. I'm happy that um, a lot of them actually lead into the next part of the talk where I want to present more about um, the actual algorithms that um, uh, we developed and that we are currently developing as well as some of the open research challenges that I think would be interesting to address in the future. Um, so first, considering this um, system architecture, I want to um, break things down and look into the specific algorithms in each unit. Um, so starting with the field mapping module, which is what some of the questions were about actually. So, so what are some of the specific challenges associated with mapping field environments? So typically, we have large field areas that we want to monitor and robot cameras which provide very high resolution images. And also for doing processes, processing on the images, for example, weed detection, as we can see here, we need a map that caters for the uncertainty in the measurements obtained from the raw data. And so the main challenge here is how can we incorporate all these elements in a single um, probabilistic compact map representation that we can then use for replanning online and also updating as new measurements are received so that we can condition a future data gathering actions according to these maps. And um, over here on the left, just to point out, this is a weed map, the data set that I mentioned previously, which is a um, data set for semantic weed mapping that we actually annotated as part of um, the Flourish project. So before we go and actually test um, our algorithms on the field, we tried to create photorealistic um, simulations by importing this data in our simulation framework. So this is like kind of an intermediate step towards real world um, deployment. And also in the 
figure on the bottom left, um, beside the uncertainty, you can see example of the wheat classification output where the green are the uh, crops, uh, the sugar beets that are detected in the field, and the red are the weeds. So this is an example of this kind of input that one could use for mapping. And on the right, I'm just showing a schematic representation of a discrete map representation that would could be used for the planning um, setup. So going into some of the theory behind our previous work, I just want to briefly present one strategy um, that I designed uh, with my colleagues during my PhD that um, accounts for these mapping challenges and informative planning for terrain monitoring. And so we designed a strategy for mapping continuous variables on the terrain. Continuous variables could be temperature um, or vegetation cover or moisture. So the main challenge here is, as we said, how to fuse this dense visual imagery from the sensor in the map in a computationally efficient manner while accounting for altitude dependent behavior. And we developed this approach, um, which directly caters for these needs. I'm just going to explain it very briefly considering the time constraints, but I put the reference on the bottom for anybody that likes to take a closer look. So essentially, in our approach, we use a Gaussian process model, which is a machine learning model to encode the spatial correlations and the distribution in a probabilistic way. So we create a Gaussian process and we use it as a prior for Bayesian data fusion as new measurements are received. So this way we have um, a correlated map at the beginning of our mapping procedure. And then as we receive new measurements with the UAV, we can project um, the field of view depending on where the UAV is and update the map in those areas accounting for the uncertainty in the measurements. So this approach has several advantages. So because the map is at a fixed resolution and by the nature of the fusion process, the computational intensity actually um, does not grow as in standard uh, mapping using Gaussian processes where the training data set increases over time. And this is one trick that we use to get faster updates and that actually allowed us to eventually run this algorithm um, online and in real time on our on our UAV, which we'll see a video of later. And secondly, one key feature is that this um, procedure also supports uh, taking measurements and updating the map with measurements at different resolutions and uncertainty. And this lends itself to um, being used with heterogeneous sensors, which is important for terrain monitoring applications. So eventually, I think it would be interesting to encode information from different sensors and to see how they influence the map. So now, uh, more recently, one of the things that we're working on is um, we notice that the objects on the field are not distributed uniformly. For example, there might be anomalies or diseases in the field regions where plants grow, grow uh, more densely. And so, um, we know that our previous method was based on mapping at a fixed resolution. And what we're currently doing is seeing whether we can somehow adapt the map, rep rep map resolution uh, based on the content of the images um, that we see online. So in such an approach conceptually, what one would want to do is preserve high detail and high resolution in areas that are considered more interesting for mapping for example, very dense plants where we need to capture finer details and use low details in area, for example, where there is not much happening, such as soil, such that these areas have lower resolution. Here is a very fresh and preliminary result um, of mapping with an adaptive resolution strategy um, in a simulation environment that we um, obtained only recently. So on the left, we can see uh, the ground truth um, of a continuous field. And in this field, the bluer regions are the ones that correspond to lower values, whereas the redder ones indicate higher values. And say that we want to map these higher valued uh, regions with a finer resolution. So in the middle, we can see a very dense fixed resolution map as in the previous approach that I presented. But on the right, um, using an adaptive resolution strategy, we can see that we adjust the mapping resolution according to the measurements received and we can set the coarse resolution in these bluer areas that are less interesting. 
So using this conceptual idea, we hope that we can save memory and computational time um, by uh, mapping in this way and leading to much faster performance for online mapping applications and this adaptive path planning. So this is some of the previous and current work that we did in mapping. And now we want to move on to how can we use these maps to find optimal maps, optimal paths for the mission within our planning algorithm. So as we said here, an open challenge is how can we quickly find paths that are valuable for data collection in a very um, high dimensional and complex problem space. So in order to address this, um, during my PhD, we developed a computationally efficient algorithm for online planning with budget constraints. So this approach operates in a finite horizon manner, alternating between replanning and plan execution until the budget is exhausted. Each new plan is a smooth polynomial trajectory that the UAV can follow and collect measurements. And so the basic idea of this um, setup is that we use the replanning procedure to tell us what the optimal data gathering actions are, and then we execute them. Um, and then when that is done, we replan again. So how do we do the actual replanning? Well, this involves two steps. First, we discretize um, the 3D space above the terrain using a grid. And then we evaluate the information value in terms of predicted measurements at each point of the grid to find an initial solution. However, this grid is very coarse due to the computational expense of exhaustively searching this 3D space, as well as the expense of evaluating all the possible measurements. So we use the grid only to find a core solution to the path planning problem, and we refine it using an optimization strategy. So in our approach, we specifically use um, an evolu evolutionary optimization strategy called the covariance matrix adaptation evolution strategy, but we can also study using different um, optimizers here. So we have a trajectory and what the optimizer does is evaluate it based on the predicted uh, measurement information value that would be gained were the UAV to execute that trajectory in the real world. And we define the objective based on the uncertainty of the current environmental model or the current map. So this unit takes um, the maps, the current map state of the environment according to the map representation that we previously discussed. Then it predicts new measurements conditioned on the map representation. And it tells us um, the best possible solution in terms of data gathering objective that it has found. So this approach um, has several desirable properties. First, we optimize in the space of smooth trajectories using our optimization routine. And this allows us to create a smooth and dynamically feasible path for the UAV. Second, the key feature is the use of this discrete grid search to initialize the optimization routine. And this enables um, us to converge much faster to a good solution then by using naive initialization as commonly done. And so this is effectively one trick we use to find good solutions faster in a very um, high dimensional and complex problem space. And finally, we're using this fixed horizon planning strategy, alternating between replanning and execution, we can create adaptive plans to map areas of interest online as they're discovered. And by modifying different parameters in this algorithm, for example, how coarse is the initial um, 3D grid search, or how many iterations do we want to use in an optimization routine, we can adjust the computational um, load of the planning procedure um, according to the computational resources that we have on a real platform. So here are some of the results. So our we first evaluate our framework um, in a simulation environment by comparing it against is fixed altitude lawnmower type coverage planning, a random motion, and the rapidly information gathering tree, which is a state-of-the-art sampling-based um, informative planning algorithm. And in these plots, we can see how the means of different information metrics, including the trace of the covariance, which corresponds to the map uncertainty, and the map error evolved during a typical mission. 
And looking at the red curve, we can confirm the performance of our approach because it leads to the fastest reductions in uncertainty and error. And this is because it allows the UAV to collect low resolution images first, as we would expect, before this descending to refine the map in targeted locations. And this informed initialization strategy based on the grid search is a key feature that allows us to quickly find informative paths in the complex problem space. Next, moving on towards um, from simulation with a step towards real world to demonstrate the integration of our system and validation, we took a publicly available data set called RIT18 and we applied um, our planning strategy and our planning framework to map this data set. So we considered three different classes in the data set for mapping, including the lake, um, the class of man-made features here, the parking lot and the building, and the uh, background class. And to make the problem interesting, we defined the class of man-made features shown in green as um, being interesting for a target targeted exploration case where online adaptive replanning is necessary. So we want to gather more information in a targeted way about these regions. So here are the results. In the experiments, we compared the targeted and non-targeted variants of our approach against two complete coverage patterns at different altitudes. Over here in the plots, we can see again how the map uncertainty and the map error evolve over time. And there are two key points to take away. So first, uh, we're able to reduce uncertainty much faster than coverage planning by flying at different altitudes. And second, in this photorealistic scenario, we demonstrated that the planner can adaptively focus on mapping interesting areas, in this case, the class of man-made features, to improve mapping accuracy much quicker in these uh, target regions. And this property is very relevant for any scenario, for example, finding the anomalies on the field where a particular class needs to be found. And finally, moving on to the question about um, real world deployment, we deployed the system in an agricultural monitoring scenario with outdoor vision based state estimation. And here it was just a simpler experiment when we used the um, RGB images to map the axis green index on a field in a uniform way without the targeted exploration requirement. And so here is a short video of the experiments coming from uh, the field trials that we did in Project Flourish. And we can see the UAV moving around to explore the space and also stopping briefly to replant. Here, um, some of the results from this experiment. So the plots show how the map evolves as we collect more measurements. And the color map signifies the level of excess green index with yellower shades corresponding to areas of higher vegetation. On the right side, we can see a graph which shows the plot of uncertainty against the number of registered images during the mission. And as we would expect by looking at the qualitative results, the map becomes more complete over time. So in particular, we can see that the UAV um, can successfully detect the less green soil and crop region in the center of the field and the greener weed regions towards its edges. Um, Looking at the plot here, we can also see um, some of the um, relative scales of the field experiment. And uh, one key focus that we have now is actually trying to improve the map quality and the map re resolution by speeding up our algorithms. So this is one of the motivations behind our adaptive resolution approach. Now, again, moving on to some more recent work, one bottleneck that we noticed in the project and in our experiments is that predicting future measurements, if we want to create high quality plans, takes time. And this is because obviously we need to simulate many future possibilities and evaluate the value of each candidate in the future. And this is very computationally expensive, especially if we want to consider many possible future plans, each of which has a very high complexity and acquiring many measurements there. And this is something that we just saw in the video as well because after each uh, trajectory, we saw the UAV stop for a little bit to think and replan the next path. So we're trying to think, how can we speed up this step? So to address this, we're currently looking at using deep learning to learn these future objectives in a simulation environment and then use them in the real world for planning. So here's the basic idea of how this workflow looks like. 
So we would like to train a neural network to plan informative paths by observing the actions of data gathering in a simulation environment. So our idea is to have a simulation where we generate a ground truth that looks like a field, and we try different sequences of actions using a Monte Carlo tree search, and then measure the information resulting from these sequences. And our hope is that if we do this enough times, simulate action sequences and observe the information gain or the reward, we can train a neural network to learn which actions are good to take if the robot were to find itself in a particular state during the mission using reinforcement learning. So this approach would speed up things significantly because we just need one forward pass to the network to figure out which action should we take next. And we don't need to do the whole story about good search and optimization as before, because everything is encoded within that one neural network pass. And um, hopefully soon we can uh, test, uh, conduct more tests with our ideas. This is something that we're currently working on and see uh, whether this will improve the speed of the planning procedure and unlock the potential for more uh, larger scale um, and better quality, larger scale applications and better quality plans. So this is about um, our research. And in the last part of the webinar, I would just like to point out some ideas for uh, future work. So one um, outstanding challenge that we noticed in when developing our algorithms is developing this model of the sensor in a probabilistic way. And this sensor model is really crucial because in order to make decisions, we need to forecast future measurements. And for this, we need a way of linking the sensor data to the map while also accounting for the uncertainty. So going back to the example of weed detection, say we have some parts of the image that would be incorrectly classified as I indicate here. So can we perform some kind of analysis that tells us how uncertain our model is in these regions and then incorporate this into the map such that we have high uncertainty associated with areas where classification is uncertain. This is something that we currently do not investigate in detail because uh, we use um, often either very simple experimental empirical models of the sensor to plan future actions or heuristic models in the case of the simulation but things would significantly improve in terms of mapping performance, we would expect if we had more accurate models of the sensor. Another um, very exciting research area, I think for um, robot autonomy as agriculture is multi-robot applications. So this could be um, incorporating heterogeneous robots with different sensors that are able to do different actions such as weeding or spraying. And then there is a question of how do we actually coordinate uh, different robots and this different sensing and action in a decision-making framework. And of course, if we want to add these additional functionalities to our framework, we need to think about, importantly, scalability. How do we scale up such methods to larger fields uh, with multiple agents, especially if we want to do mapping and field analysis on very high resolution? And by addressing these challenges in the future, um, I really hope that we can ascend the scale of robot autonomy and enable robots to take on new roles in agricultural practices. And so moving on to the closing of the webinar, I would just like to present a quick summary of what was discussed. So I started by introducing a little bit about our previous work and our uh, working setup here in FINRAB um, at the University of Bonn and Fortune Center Mulek. Then uh, we moved on to our vision and our research group for intelligent robots that do autonomous active decision-making. And we discussed some of the key uh, research challenges associated with um, towards enabling this type of behavior. We presented some solution based on our previous work um, an informative planning framework, focusing on the application of UV-based active sensing as a motivation. And I briefly outlined a roadmap for future work to how we can get um, intelligent, more intelligent robots onto our farms and advance uh, smart farming. So with that, I would like to thank you for uh, your attention. And thanks again for the opportunity to speak. And I'm happy to take any more questions. OK, thank you very much for a great talk. 
So I'm uh, I'll just wait for people to write in any any other um, questions. So while we're waiting, what's the resolution of the um, images that you're working with now that you're able to process online? Um, so we need to uh, basically it is really constrained by the map resolution. So for okay. example, over here. Um, we're not able to do mapping at a pixel resolution. So the issue is not in, uh, we need to somehow summarize the information with uh, from the high resolution camera images to fit it in this compact map rep representation. Otherwise the mapping would be way too slow if we're doing pixel level online mapping. So I think over here, it was like, I think uh, like 20 centimeters or something like this. Um, for the resolution of the map on the field. Okay. And we were doing mapping in a 20 by 20 environment. So I'm just bringing this up as an example of something that was working in the real world. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, the question is, how would you move from using these sensors to actual management actions, such as spraying or cutting weeds? Uh, or using something like lasers, such as uh, some research labs are doing? Um, so right now, these work packages are quite separate. But ideally, uh, what I would like to see is coordination between the robots or some kind of other UAV that can also um, do spraying actions. And then I think uh, what I would be very interested in, how can we coordinate the, these behavior to do these um, this um, functionality in an efficient way. So the robots working together type of thing. Otherwise, what you could simply do is use the map that was generated by the UAV and then pass it to a ground robot. Then it can plan some kind of simple shortest path through these targeted areas. OK. And then um, another question is, when you say mapping, do you mean a representation of spectral reflectance off of the uh, I'm sorry, let me start again. When you say mapping, do you mean a representation of spectral reflectance across a field? In other words, is it possible to map, map textual information? Um, so what is the map represent, re representing, I think? Um, oh, so basically it can represent um, different things depending on the variable that you're monitoring. So over here in the simple real life experiment, it was Excel green index, which is based on the image channels. So you basically look at uh, the apply the um, kind of Excel green index formula, and then you use this as your measurement that you fuse into the map incrementally. And another application with the weed mapping we looked at is the probability of a particular uh, region of the field being occupied by that weed. And uh, how did you assess whether the field would be occupied by weeds because you knew where the crop was planted, for instance? Um, because this is the information that we get from the weed classific uh, classification module. OK. So if we go back again to the mapping part, and I would just, maybe I also always like to show, explain with images. So basically, if you have something like this from a classification, and you can kind of project onto the field and you have the, then the probability of that area being occupied by the weed based on the information of the image. This is like, it, it is similar to essentially occupancy mapping in robotics, except we're mapping weed occupancy. Right, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, and then um, I, another, question is, is it possible to do real-time recommendation instead of having two UAVs, one gather the data and the other, um, for example, spreading fertilizer or spraying, you could do, use one UAV to do both. So can you repeat the question? There was a bit of uh, interference with the microphone, I think. Sure. Would it be possible to do real-time recommendation? So instead of having two UAVs with one gathering the data and the other, for example, spreading fertilizer, could you use one UAV to do both? 
Um, I'm not sure. I can't uh, because we haven't looked into this in so much detail. I would be super excited about this idea, though. Okay. Um, and then another question is, how sensitive is this framework to environmental conditions such as lighting? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, basically, uh, based on the or like the real life experiments that we did, um, it really depends on the camera. So when we performed, um, a colleague of mine was working on the perception part of the UAV. So when we kind of um, did and controlled the lighting, uh, more controlled lighting conditions and adjusting for like the exposure of the camera, it worked relatively fine. But for example, we had one field experiment where the whole thing was super bad because it was uh, just changing all the time, like cloudy and then sunny. So I think this is something that we need to address from the uh, perception side. Okay. Because there's nothing within the frameworks that I presented here that actually accounts for this and does the appropriate adjustment so that the algorithm can work properly. All right. Another question is, what multispectral camera do you use for the real-time applications? Uh, actually, I don't remember for Flourish. It's there, or it's over there in this paper, actually, that's currently on the slide. So but before I say something wrong, I would recommend to have a look at the paper. <laughs> okay. um, right now, we uh, we did not buy, um, we're just, uh, we just brought a drone that we'll, we'll receive in, like, next month and then based on that we'll get the sensors so we for our current research group we didn't deal with the hardware yet okay all right um well that's i think i've covered all the questions and we've had a really um, good dynamic webinar so we can um, close and anyone who wants to um has any questions for maria can um can write her uh, you have, if you have trouble finding information, just write me. Uh, and thank you all for attending. Thank you so much, Maria, for the webinar. Thanks. All right. Bye, everyone. Pleasure.